Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, 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 please. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Ken, thank you for a generous welcome. Thank you all. Uh, Secretary Pat Kennedy and Director General Linda Thomas Greenfield, thank you for being here and others. We appreciate it. Tara, everybody, thank you for being here. And Ken, uh, when I heard you say you could talk forever about uh, my uh, efforts uh, on behalf of LGBT. I was sitting there like any formally elected person for 29 years, and I said, go ahead, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> uh, but no such luck today. Uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with all of you, and very, very special to welcome uh, just some super special guests here. I want them to stand up, and I want everybody to say thank you to them and recognize them. Uh, Judy and Dennis Shepard are here, and we're so grateful for you being here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I uh, remind everybody that it is amazing to think, but it has been nearly 15 years uh, since we mourned the tragic murder of their son, Matthew. And I can remember very clearly uh, meeting uh, them previously and speaking to uh, the crowd gathered on the National Mall uh, in front of the Capitol building at a vigil that was held uh, two nights after he was killed. Thousands of people came together to share their grief, but also to share their sense of outrage that such an act could be carried out, such a senseless, violent, terrible heartbreak. And we were all standing with Judy and Dennis uh, out on that dark night. And frankly, since then, they have helped to lead the way through darkness and into the light. And they've turned their pain and their loss into a remarkable global message of hope and of tolerance. So Judy and Dennis, uh, make no mistake, you, you really do inspire us, and we are very honored to have you here with us today. Thank you. I also want, I know uh, Congressman John Lewis was here a little bit ago, I think, uh, and uh, he, he had to leave uh, to go vote. Uh, there's, there are few members, uh, few people I've met in life who I admire as much as John Lewis. Uh, he was almost killed on that day down in Selma, uh, and he led at the side of Martin Luther King and others to break the back of John Crow, Jim Crow in uh, this country. And John is just without doubt one of the most self-effacing, beautiful human beings I have ever met, and an amazing person of courage who demonstrates what you can do against, as Bobby Kennedy said, the enormous array of the world's ills. So we thank him for being here today, and most importantly, we thank him for standing up on the front lines of fighting for people's rights for all of these years. I also want to thank uh, Mara Kiesling from the National Center for Transgender uh, Equality. Uh, thanks for being here and uh, for your contributions, and I want to thank Acting Assistant Secretary Uzra Zaya from our Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Uh, we're very, very grateful also to uh, the Gay Men's Chorus of Washington for that wonderful rendition of our national anthem, and thank you for their performance. Uh, as Ken said, um, I have had the privilege of being involved in the struggle for rights, for LGBT rights, for a long period of time, and it is a privilege. Uh, coming from Massachusetts, Maybe we inherently know something about fighting for rights from the inception. But uh, it wasn't that long ago, as I recall, many of you I'm sure do too, when things looked very different from the way they look today. If you want an amusing read before you go to sleep, go get the transcript of my testimony before Strom Thurmond on the Armed Services Committee 20 years ago when we first pushed for an end on the ban on gays in the military. If you want to read a Senate hearing that is actually literally like a Saturday Night Skit, Saturday Night Live skit, 
that is it. And I won't go into all the questions that Strom and his inimitable accent posed to me, but I walked out of there thinking that I was truly uh, on a different planet, or he was, one or the other. Uh, but we ran into a wall of misunderstanding and uh, of misperception. Uh, but as we are learning even today, as we look at various places in the world where homophobia raises it, its ugly and frightened head, we see that uh, there is fear and that a lot is driven by fear, always has been. Uh, not always with respect to LGBT issues, but with respect to people generally, with respect to race and religion. Uh, and this is an ongoing battle for all of us, and believe me, not just for us. It is an ongoing battle in hidden parts of this planet, in dark corners where there is no light, where people are thrown into jail, or worse, uh, beaten, brutally uh, uh, tortured, and even murdered because of who they are or what they believe. So we have an enormous challenge ahead of us, and all of you, every single person here, because you have the privilege of being here in this building, in this freedom, able to talk about this. It is because of that that you actually bear also a larger responsibility. Uh, when I voted, as Ken said, in 1996, uh, I don't claim any great act of courage. Maybe it's because uh, I did represent the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but nevertheless, I was proud to be the only person running for re-election that year in those 14 who actually uh, voted against DOMA. And I am confident that if the Supreme Court adheres to the law and to precedent, uh, that it must be found unconstitutional. Now, we also know that we've made pro that's <laughs> worth Now, if it isn't, you can take that applause back in your home someday. <laughs> uh, obviously, the landscape has changed remarkably fast. And, and every one of you here deserves credit for that. Uh, you all know your individual journeys uh, in this effort, whether you are a member of the LGBT community or whether you are a supporter and a friend and here in solidarity with it. But everybody understands that uh, uh, things are changing because people have dared to stand up and show solidarity and, and speak common sense and talk truth to sometimes ugly power. And the fact is that we have an administration today that I am proud to say no longer defends the constitutionality of DOMA. That's an enormous step forward. We also have a Senate that recently welcomed its first openly gay member. And we have a record number in the House of Representatives. I can remember when the first, first person came out in the House of Representatives uh, within the service time of my service in the Senate. We also have seen how don't ask, don't tell is now a part of history <clears throat> and that no American who wants to wear the uniform of their country that they love will be denied the chance to serve the country they love because of whom they love. So we're making progress, and that is the sort of change that we are seeing spread across the country as state after state breaks down the barrier, the real barriers, to honest equality, not only in the workplace but throughout life. But we have to say, as we gather here today, that uh, we still do have a distance to travel. Far too many women and men and families are still denied equality under our laws. Two of my former constituents, just to give you an example, I got to meet them, a fellow named uh, Junior and Tim who were married in Massachusetts, but because of DOMA, the federal government didn't recognize their marriage, and so the law treated them differently than if they had been man and woman married. And, and Time after time when I met with them, and I did frequently, and learned how hard it was that they couldn't choose the path that they wanted to for themselves. Uh, but they also reminded me in the course of their life history what, in fact, uh, 
marriage is supposed to be all about, which is an enduring love, uh, a love that actually keeps you together even when you've been separated and it's as if you hadn't been. And, and I'll tell you uh, why, because one of them was out of the country and couldn't come back in and we had to go through hoops to be able to actually ultimately reunite them here in our country because of our immigration laws. Uh, they're not alone. A few weeks ago, I was standing right here in this room at my first town hall when a young FSO named uh, Salim Araturk stood up and told a similar story about his life and his partner, uh, whom he'd met overseas uh, during his first tour. And you have to jump through hoops to be treated fairly. I know that many of you have probably experienced very similar stories or even experienced them individually. Uh, so the reality is, even as we celebrate, we have to come here today and commit ourselves to the ultimate task of fulfilling equality under the law here in our own country. And we have to be clear-eyed about the challenges that remain. Uh, I believe that we are on an irreversible course. And I believe happily that the United States of America is helping to set a global example for how people ought to be treated in life. Uh, I think that uh, I, I make this commitment to you that as Secretary of State, uh, I will continue uh, to stand right where I have stood uh, throughout my years of elected service. And that begins with how we treat our LGBT colleagues right here in the State Department. And I think uh, under Pat and Linda's and other people's stewardship, uh, we are already doing an outstanding job. Same-sex partners and spouses at overseas missions enjoy the same benefits allowed by law as all of our employees' families. And we've included a category for same-sex partners in our personnel system. It's now easier for transgender Americans to change the gender on their passport. It may seem like a small thing, but it's a big deal. And we've stated unequivocally that this department does not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. I'm happy to say that these steps reflect not just a department view, but the President Obama's view. And President Obama's commitment to full equality, no matter who you are or who you love. And as Americans uh, send us out to show our face to the world in this department, we will set an example through our respect for the rights of people everywhere. Having GLIFA members as part of that American face, frankly, helps us demonstrate our leadership. Our work, though, is more than just setting an example. Uh, we got to be out there showing up in places where progress on LGBT rights has been slower and harder to achieve. And we're using our tools of development and diplomacy actually leverage our efforts forward in this endeavor. And we remain focused on this and will because American leadership requires promoting universal values. That's what this represents. This isn't an aberration. This isn't some step out of the mainstream. It's actually the mainstream is out of step with what ought to be the mainstream. The mainstream represents the recognition of universal rights that have been true since humankind began writing about them and defining them. And as we have moved through the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries to this place in the 21st century where we understand that dignity and, and equality uh, and the rights of all people are at the center of what we ought to be espousing in our public and our private life. When we see the abuse of those values that are directed at the LGBT community, we have a moral obligation to stand in pride with LGBT individuals and advocates. We have a moral obligation to decry the marginalization and persecution of LGBT persons. And we have a moral obligation to promote societies that are more just, more fair, and tolerant. It is the right thing to do. It's also in our country's strategic interest. Greater inclusion and protection of human rights, including those for LGBT people and for their communities, 
leads to greater stability, greater prosperity, and greater protection for the rights of human beings. Stronger partners on the world stage are built out of this endeavor. And the truth is that in the end, it can actually help project peace and security across a whole region. And that is why in 2011, President Obama issued the first ever presidential memorandum on the human rights of LGBT persons globally, directing that all agencies abroad must ensure that our diplomacy and our foreign assistance promotes and protects these rights. And, and, and I think we have accomplished a great deal on this issue. With our support, the, the UN Human Rights Council passed its first ever resolution affirming the rights of LGBT persons. Through PEPFAR's Blueprint for an AIDS-Free Generation, we are working to scale up HIV services for LGBT individuals who are often at uh, higher risk. Our Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration is expanding our effort to help LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And we are providing LGBT travelers with information about countries where they may face prosecution or arrest, persecution. Overseas, we're encouraging our missions to think about how do you best support these goals. And here at home, we've set up a department-wide task force that will develop new approaches in order to try to better integrate LGBT uh, policy into our foreign policy. And through our Global Partnerships Initiative, I just met with members of it a few minutes ago, we have set up the Global Equality Fund, and that will support LGBT human rights defenders on the front lines. We're working with like-minded governments including Norway, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Iceland, and Finland. And we have partnered with private sector leaders, including the Mac AIDS Fund uh, and the John D. Evans Foundation. I think they both are here. Uh, and we are especially grateful to the Arcus Foundation, which will match any corporate contribution that we receive up to $1 million. And we hope that, our, that additional partners are going to join us in this critical effort. So all of this that I've talked about is a good start, my friends, but it's just that. It's a start. Last week, the President appointed three openly gay ambassadors to Denmark, Spain, and to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And they will build on the tremendous record and work by Ambassador uh, Hubner and former Ambassadors uh, Hormel and Guest. In fact, I remember the confirmation hearing for former Ambassador Hormel, which in itself was a kind of groundbreaking, difficult process, uh, which we ultimately uh, succeeded in winning. So we are committed to seeing more LGDP persons in senior positions in this department. And I ask for your input and all of your ideas so that in the coming days uh, I can sit down and uh, work with our team here to ensure that the department is properly resourcing and prioritizing our international efforts for the next generation of LGBT progress. I think everybody here knows uh, this isn't automatic, not always an easy path. Uh, there is fear, and from the fear, the hate that sometimes comes with it that translates too often into violence. Uh, we still see anti-propaganda laws in Eastern Europe that are targeting LGBT demonstrators. We still hear reports of violence amongst, against uh, transgender persons in Latin America and Asia. Uh, we still see uh, the enforcement of archaic sodomy laws in the Caribbean, and we see abuse and incarceration of LGBT activists in Africa. But I believe, as I think you do, that today we come here in pride, with pride, to celebrate the fact that uh, the winds of freedom are blowing in the right direction. We know that the intolerance towards LGBT brothers and sisters fades with each passing generation. And it is with a belief in our common humanity, in the fundamental worth of every human being, 
that we have to keep moving forward towards our goal of shared justice and equality here in our country and around the world. So I especially join here today in saying to our GLIFA members uh, and to all of you, a happy pride every day the world over. Thank you for the privilege of being with you. Thank you.